The top stories tonight in Y News. President Rodrigo Duterte might, might extend the declaration of state of calamity in the country. Most likely po dahil habang wala pong bakuna, habang walang gamot sa COVID, patuloy po ang epekto ng pandemya. A transport group fears for the safety of drivers and commuters with implementation of reduced physical distancing. The health department, when asked, did not clearly answer whether or not it is in favor of the measure. While after criticisms, the Interagency Task Force for the Management of Emerging Infectious Diseases will tackle the implementation of the reduced physical distancing again in their meeting tomorrow. Some lawmakers question the proposed budget of the Office of, Office of the President for next year allotted for the Intelligence Fund. On the other hand, some members of the Committee on Appropriations propose to, the increase, the, to increase the budget of the Office of the Vice President, which VP Lenny Robredo herself defended. In today's Senate budget hearing, Senator Nancy Binay questioned the Department of Budget and Management on the lack of funding for the rehabilitation of communities affected by the Taal volcano eruption in January and Davao earthquakes last year under the proposed 2021 national budget. Kung makiki hati pa itong taal rehab dun sa existing na and dream si fund for uh, future calamities for next year eh uh, baka lalo talagang wala nang matira at hindi na maumpisahan itong rehabilitation we understand po that kaya nga po uh, bakit nga po hindi lamang wala din po kasi kaming pagbabasihan dahil wala pa naman po kaming natatanggap uh, except po yung mga may evacuation centers na inaksyonan din po namin. Chinese investment in Australia plummets as diplomatic tensions rise between the two countries. Air and Z reveals cheap flights as physical distancing is lifted for planes and public transport in New Zealand. Good evening, Philippines and the world. Today is Monday, September 14, 2020. I am Horilin Delgado. Join us in the next hour as we deliver today's top stories around the Philippines and in other parts of the world. I am Marigella Toza. We are also seen in 1,935 satellite monitoring centers nationwide and via live streaming worldwide through the UNTV News and Rescue social media accounts and our website, untvweb.com. I am Elsie Marcos. First in the news, President Rodrigo Duterte may extend the declaration of state of calamity due to coronavirus disease. Meanwhile, households affected by granular lockdowns will receive emergency subsidy from the government. Our Malacanang correspondent, Rosa Licoz, explains why. To prevent further community transmission of COVID-19, lockdowns are implemented in compounds, streets, sitio, purok, or barangays with high incidence of COVID-19 instead of city-wide or province-wide lockdowns. Under the Bayanihan to Recover as One or Bayanihan Two Law, signed on Friday by President Rodrigo Duterte, the government shall provide 5 to 8,000 pesos of emergency subsidy as part of the 13 billion peso appropriation under the Cash for Work programs for displaced workers. However, the subsidy received from the Conditional Cash Transfer Program and the rice subsidy will be taken into consideration in the computation of the emergency subsidy. Magbibigay po tayo ng 5 to 8,000 pesos na ayuda dun sa mga mamamayan na mapapasaloob po ng granular lockdown na idideklara ng mga lokal na pamahalaan. At bukod pa po dito, yung balanse po ng 13 billion ay bibigay po natin yan para sa mga nawalan ng trabaho at yan po ay uh, ibibigay po ng dole at magbibigay din po tayo ng tulong dun sa mga nais na magkaroon ng training para magkaroon puli ng mga bagong trabaho. 
Meanwhile, President Duterte may extend the declaration of the state of calamity throughout the country due to COVID-19. It was on March 16, 2020, when President Duterte signed Proclamation No. 929. The proclamation is effective for six months or until September 16. Under the State of Calamity Declaration, the national government as well as the local government units can utilize appropriate funds including the Quick Response Fund to respond against the health crisis. Most likely po dahil habang wala pong bakuna, habang walang gamot sa COVID, patuloy po ang epekto ng pandemya. Rosa Licoz, UNTV News and Rescue. We serve the people, we give glory to God. The Philippine National Police is in favor of closing cemeteries in places with high incidence of coronavirus disease. Our police correspondent, Leia Ilagan, explains why. In order to stop the spread of the virus, the Philippine National Police has also approved the decision of the Metro Manila mayors to close cemeteries in Metro Manila this coming long holiday. Depende rin naman kung saan ang mga areas of uh, concern natin with regard to COVID. Maganda talaga si NCL, tama yan, nagsarado na ng cemeteryo. It has been announced earlier that Metro Manila mayors have agreed to close cemeteries in the National Capital Region from October 30 until November 3, 2020. However, PNP Chief Police General Camilo Cascolan has instructed his regional directors to inspect cemeteries which will remain open if people would be observing minimum health protocols. We are coming up already with a lot of uh, things that is not normal before, but it becomes a new normal. So all regions will differ from each other, depending on the infection or the uh, pandemic. Leia Ilagan, UNTV News and Rescue. We serve the people, we give glory to God. Malacanang defends the government's decision to allow hotel staycation in general community quarantine or GCQ areas, including Metro Manila. It was Tourism Secretary Bernadette Romulo, Romulo Puyat who confirmed over the weekend that the Interagency Task Force has allowed staycations in GCQ areas to restart tourism activities during the community quarantine period. The Tourism Department will release guidelines on this measure. Sa ngayon po sa second national action plan po ng ating national task force, no, talagang unti-unti po natin binubuksan natin ang ekonomiya at itong pinaplano po natin ay uh, ng DOT, DOT ay uh, sa alinsunod naman po doon sa unti-unting pagbubukas ng uh, sektor ng turismo. So kumbaga po, uh, that's, that marks the beginning of uh, the reopening of our tourism industry here in Metro Manila. Let's give it a chance. A transport group fears for the safety of drivers and commuters with reduced physical distancing. The Department of Transportation, however, stands by its decision to implement reduced physical distancing on public transport. Asher Gatap Kadapan Jr. details why. The Alliance of Concerned Transport Organizations, or ACTO, expresses dismay over the implementation of reduced physical distance on public transportation, which commences today. The Interagency Task Force has approved the Department of Transportation's recommendation of reducing physical distance among passengers to 0.75 or 3 fourth meter. The measure aims to accommodate more passengers on public transport as more industries reopen with the easing of community quarantine restrictions. But the transport group explains it is not yet time to relax physical distancing. ACTO says that the government should instead allow more units of public utility vehicles to resume their operation to address the increasing number of passengers. ACTO President Efren De Luna says that 30% of traditional jeepneys and 70% of UV Express operations are still suspended. Drivers also fear for their own safety as well as for the passengers due to the higher risk that reduced physical distance poses. Hindi naman kami masyadong uh, sangayon dyan, no? Dahil for security pa rin na ang number one sa amin, security ng mga pasahero at yung siguridad din ng aming mga, mga driver. Ang gawin na lamang ng LTPRB, buksan ng lahat ang mga linya ng mga, mga sasakyan. 
The DOTR, on the other hand, maintains its decision to implement the measure. Transport officials explain that they have been continuously allowing traditional jeepneys to operate with more than 1,000 units added on routes with a higher passenger demand. The Transportation Department also assures that the measure was carefully studied and that other health and safety measures are also strictly imposed along with its implementation. Ang sinasabi nga ng Secretary Tugadi dito, itong uh, pag -e enforce natin itong optimization of physical distancing should not undermine the strict enforcement of uh, health and sanitation protocols. So yan, di ba yung one meter physical distancing na yan na sinight ng uh, WHO in the past, Hindi naman yan, hindi hindi na na consider yung other present health interventions. So, wala yung pagsusuot ng face mask at pagsusuot ng face shield. Eh di ba sa public transportation nga napaka-strict niyan. So, bawal kang sumakay kung wala kang face mask, bawal kang sumakay kung wala kang face shield. And at the same time, inimplement din natin yung no talking. So, bawal kang makipag-usap sa katabi mo. Bawal ka ring sumagot ng telepono. Asher Kadapan Jr., UNTV News and Rescue, we serve the people, we give glory to God. The Interagency Task Force for the Management of Emerging Infectious Diseases will tackle the implementation of reduced physical distancing on public transportation again. Joan Nano tells us why. The IATF against COVID-19 will include on the agenda in their next meeting the implementation of reduced physical distancing following criticisms and fear of further transmission of COVID-19. Presidential Spokesperson Secretary Harry Roque confirmed this earlier today during a press briefing. Hindi naman tayo magbibingi-bingihan sa mga opinion ng ating mga medical frontliners. So bubuksan po uli ang usapin tungkol dito bukas po sa susunod na uh, meeting ng IATF. Secretary Roque made the assurance as some health experts say they are not in favor of the measure. According to Dr. Antonio Danz, a representative of the Healthcare Professionals Alliance Against COVID-19 or HPAC, relaxing the physical distancing policy might result in the mounting of COVID-19 cases in the country. Pag titingnan natin ang curve ng pandemic na ito, masyadong maaga pa. No? At uh, uh, Malamang na dumami lali ang, lalo ang kaso at bumagal ang recovery natin kung gawin natin ito ngayon. Meanwhile, the Transportation Department reiterates that the implementation of reduced physical distancing on public transportation is based on international studies by the experts. Ang ginawa po ng International Union of Railways, tinignan po nila yung lahat ng experience po ng mga iba't ibang bansa na miyembro po ng International Union of Railways. At nakita po nila na hindi po sa public transportation, hindi po sa rail system nagmumula ang transmission o hindi po ito ang vector for transmission ng COVID-19. Uh, kung titingnan po natin ngayon, karamihan po ng ibang bansa, lalo na po dito sa Asia, na po nag enforce ng one week and distancing between passenger. Yung iba po ay hindi na po nag i enforce niyan. Tapos makikita po rin sa datos na from the time na last po yung mga bansa na yan at at uh, Tinanggal na po nila yung social distancing or binawasan nila yung social distancing nila sa kanilang mga rail sector at saka sa iba pang transport sectors. Makikita po na actually bumaba po ang mga COVID cases nito mga bayan nato. The DOTR admits that prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, public transportation in the Philippines was insufficient. But transport officials emphasize they will not yet allow the full operation on all routes as the movement of people still needs to be limited to stem the spread of the virus. Joe Hanano, UNTV News and Rescue. We serve the people, we give glory to God. The health department, when asked, did not clearly answer whether or not it is in favor of the reduced physical distancing on public transport. Our health correspondent, Aiko Miguel, explains why. Health beat reporters asked the DOH at a virtual forum this morning if they are in favor of the implementation of reduced physical distancing on public transport, which started today. But the DOH officials had no clear answer whether or not they are in favor of this measure. According to health spokesperson under Secretary Maria Rosario Vergere, they issued a statement last night that the Department of Transportation is the lead agency in implementing transport guidelines. The DOH values the protection of lives and livelihoods and we are for sparing economic recovery. 
the Department of Transportation, being the lead agency, is responsible for issuing and enforcing transport guidelines to ensure that the public's health and safety are not compromised. Now, the DOH advises the public to be extra cautious and be responsible in observing the health standards when on public transport. The health department encourages the public to choose and ride vehicles with one meter distancing. We would like to call on the public to be extra vigilant in situations where distancing cannot be practiced and if possible, choose to participate in activities or use transport options that will allow you at least one meter distancing. It will also add protection to people if they wear a face mask and a face shield and practice regular hand washing. Senior citizens and the immunocompromised or those with medical conditions are advised not to go outdoors when unnecessary. Please stay at home. Stay home when you don't need to go out. Together po, kaya po natin protektahan ang ating sarili at ang ating mga mahal sa buhay. Ay ko Miguel, UNTV News and Rescue. We serve the people. We give glory to God. Meanwhile, the country's Department of Health says that almost 4,700 newly confirmed cases were added today, raising the total confirmed cases of coronavirus infection in the Philippines to 265,888. That is 0.24% of the total Philippine population. The remaining active cases have decreased to 53,754. More than 2.9 million individuals in the country have been tested for coronavirus in total. We have lost 259 more patients. But through our fervent prayers, medical interventions, and sacrifices of our medical frontliners, 249 more people have won their battle against the invisible enemy. That brings the total recoveries nationwide to 207,504, which is 78% of the total confirmed cases in the country. Thanks be to God. Now take a closer look at the updated count of coronavirus cases around the world. The COVID-19 pandemic has now reached a total of more than 29 million confirmed cases in 188 countries, regions, and sovereignty. That is, after almost 308,000 new confirmed cases were recorded across several countries. The fast-spreading disease has over or has claimed over 924,000 lives, while more than 19.6 million patients across the globe have recovered from the new coronavirus infection. Thanks be to God. The South Cotabato Provincial Government has launched a helpline for residents and individuals who are experiencing stress amid the present health crisis. The helpline is made possible through the efforts together with the Provincial Anti-Drug Abuse Council, Integrated Provincial Health Office, and the United Registered Social Workers. Through this, the provincial government aims to bring psychosocial first aid and support from registered social workers. Interventions are based on national and international standards. The helpline numbers are 0931-176-5822, 0917-620-4263, and 0908-861-8003. The Soxhargen region begins to use its Region 12 COVID-19 contact tracing system or R12 CCTs. Residents in the region are encouraged to register online. The R uh, R12 CCTs originated from the previous South Cotabato COVID-19 contact tracing system. According to Jennifer Bretana, Provincial Planning and Development Coordinator, Several LGUs in Region 12 have coordinated with them on data migration, including Cotabato City. The Department of the Interior and Local Governments will work on capacity building. The city government of Valenzuela launches a new contact tracing application called the Valenzuela Tracing or Val Trace application. Vincent Arboleda will tell us why. 
The city government of Valenzuela wants to eliminate the method of filling out contact tracing forms whenever people enter establishments in the city. The Valenzuela LGU believes the filling out of forms contribute to the spread of COVID-19. That is why the city government launched its own contact tracing application, the Valenzuela Tracing Application or Valtrace through City Ordinance Number 783 for contactless contact tracing. The system uses QR code a substitute to contact tracing forms. The city also launches its no QR code no entry policy. But instead of November, the no QR code no entry policy will be implemented starting October 5, according to Lauro Caina, head of the Valenzuela City Public Information Office. With the no QR code no entry policy, all residents and visitors of the city need to register via Valtrace to get a QR code that will be shown whenever entering establishments within Valenzuela City. But if a resident has no cell phone, they can print out a QR code and then have it laminated. To register, just go to the website valtrace.appcase.net and provide details such as name, address, contact number, birthday, email address, username, and password. All establishments in Valenzuela are also required to download the merchant version of the app that will give them access to a QR code scanner that will be used to scan the QR codes of people entering their establishments. Meanwhile, the National Privacy Commission reminds businesses to only get the bare minimum information needed for contact tracing under the Data Privacy Act. Attorney Stephen John Dumas says that it must be also clear to clients that the establishment has enough capacity to protect the information as well as the collection process and deletion. Kainya assures the public of the confidentiality of all information which will remain only for 30 days before being deleted from the system. This is more secure than manually filling out the form, di ba? Ayaw sleep. Hindi mo alam kung pagkalagay mo doon sa parang sambiolo kung saan na siya napupunta actually. Pero ito, isa lang ang pinapuntahan niya yung contact tracing system. Vincent Arboleda, UNTV News and Rescue. We serve the people. We give glory to God. Some lawmakers question the proposed budget of the Office of the President for next year allotted for the Intelligence Fund. On the other hand, some members of the Committee on Appropriations proposed to increase the budget of the Office of the Vice President, which VP Leni Robredo herself defended. One of our senior correspondents, Ray Pelayo, tells us why live. Yes, Ray? Early the today, Makabayan Black lawmakers scrutinized the 4.5 billion peso confidential and intelligence fund proposed by the Office of the President as part of its 8.2 billion peso uh, proposed budget for 2021. One of them was Kabayan Party Lease Representative Sara Ilago. Bakit higit sa kalahati ng pondo po ng presidente ay patagupong ginagamit? In response, the Office of the President explained that the Confidential and Intelligence Fund has a wide coverage to maintain peace and order in the country, especially against terrorism. The fund is now reported as uh, not reported as detailed as other funds because it concerns national security. Deputy Executive Secretary Alberto Bernardo of the Office of the President clarified we need more protection in the middle of the pandemic. Mas mahalaga po nga sa ganitong crisis, sa pagkat na patunayan natin kahit na merong pandemya ng COVID, meron pa rin tayo mga bombers na nangyari dito sa, sa Sulu. Marami pa rin nagsasamantala ng mga terorista sa kuguluhang dulot ng uh, COVID na magsasamantala para pabagsakit ang sekuridad ng uh, bangsa, bangsa ito. Meanwhile, some lawmakers support increase of the proposed budget amount of the Office of the Vice President amounting to 679 million pesos. Vice President Len Robredo said they originally requested 720 million pesos from the Department of Budget and Management. The official notes that her office has already served almost half a million beneficiaries under the Angat Buhay program. Their uh, resources come from private sectors. 
in essence, um, your honors, what we're doing is just trying to fill in the gaps. Uh, we are fully aware that our office is very small. Uh, we're very small, not just with the number of, of staff that we have, but we're very small in terms of resources. So we're making do with what we have. Arlene? Uh, Ray, what other items are in the proposed budget of the OVP aside from the Angat Buhay program? Well, uh, the uh, projects of the Office of the Vice President uh, mainly aims to assist uh, communities, especially in those uh, far-flung areas. And uh, other projects include uh, the uh, assistance for the uh, production of PPEs, the local production of PPEs. And uh, some are to assist those who are uh, mostly in need, like in those, uh, they call it in Tagalog, Lailayan. So uh, that's part of the uh, project of the Office of the Vice President. All right. Thank you so much, Ray Pelayo, for that report. The Health Department will postpone the issuance of the omnibus guidelines for the use of antigen test kits. Aiko Miguel details why. The World Health Organization does not recommend the use of antigen testing for travelers. This recommendation came after reports of travelers turning out to be positive for coronavirus, despite testing negative in rapid tests. Now, the country's Department of Health confirms it will revise the guidelines for the use of antigen testing for all domestic air travelers. Uh, it is not advisable no, to use it sa mga borders uh, uh, for screening. No? Uh, so, isa yan sa atin uh, magkakaroon yan ng effect no, sa ginagawa nating guidelines because as we have said, we have recommended that this uh, be used no uh, para dun sa mga borders natin para dun sa mga incoming uh, mga tourists yung mga ganyan kasi nga sandali lang siya accurate naman siya now WHO is recommending that we should uh, it is recommend they are recommending no, not to use it uh, sa mga border screening kailangan lang namin pag-aralan maigi para align tayo at saka hindi rin tayo magkamali sa gagawin natin it can be recalled that last week, the IATF approved the use of antigen test kits for tourists and travelers. The DOH is supposed to issue this week the omnibus guidelines approved by the government for the use of RT-PCR testing kits, rapid antibody testing kits, and antigen testing kits. But this will be postponed. So with that, babaguhin ngayon ng Health Technology Assessment Council natin yung kanilang recommendations for rapid antigen and yung amping omnibus guidelines with regard to the use of rapid antigen na isinama na natin ay mababago rin dahil sa ebidensyang ito. We need to present again to IATF this revised version because of this as a result no, of these recommendations coming from WHO. But hopefully, if we can present by tomorrow or Thursday, by early next week, we can already issue this omnibus guidelines. Meanwhile, the DOH also considers foreign expert studies on COVID-19, especially those with proven and concrete evidence. But according to Undersecretary Vergere, they are uncertain whether face masks could give people COVID-19 immunity. This was her answer when asked about a published release on the New England Journal of Medicine, which claims that face masks can help people be immune to COVID-19. We still have to study further itong sinasabing immunity. Sa kawalan natin ngayon no, ng gamot at wala pa yung bakuna kapag ikaw ay nag face mask this would uh, make you live with the virus parang ganun ano parang ganun ang tema but i don't think that uh, non pharmaceutical intervention can um, boost your immune system to give you that immunity baka ito lang yung talagang preventive measure that can really work I go Miguel, UNTV News and Rescue. We serve the people, we give glory to God. In today's Senate budget hearing, Senator Nancy Binay questioned the Department of Budget and Management or DBM on the lack of funding for the rehabilitation of communities affected by the Taal volcano eruption in January and Davao earthquakes last year under the proposed 2021 national budget. 
The proposed NDRRMC fund next year is at 20 billion pesos. According to DBM, there is no budget specifically earmarked for the rehabilitation because they have yet to receive the request for funding from the NDRRMC or the Office of the Civil Defense. Budget Secretary Wendel Avisado says the funding earlier allocated for the Davao rehabilitation worth 5 billion pesos remains to be unutilized. Kung makikihati pa itong Taal Rehab dun sa existing na Endream C Fund for uh, future calamities for next year, eh uh, baka lalo talagang wala nang matira at hindi na maumpisahan itong rehabilitation. We understand po that, kaya nga po, uh, bakit nga po hindi lamang, wala din po kasi kami po pabasihan dahil wala pa naman po kami natatanggap. Uh, except for yung mga may evacuation centers na inaksyonan din po namin. Senator Binay hopes that the fund request will be made the soonest possible time while the budget deliberations are ongoing. The UN TV News has tried to reach the NDRRMC and the OCD, but they have yet to comment on the matter. Meanwhile, Senate Minority Leader Franklin Drilon also questioned the overpriced testing kits that the government purchased months ago. Months ago. Drilon said the RNA extraction kits brought from Lifeline Diagnostic Supplies were overpriced by 41.2 million pesos and those purchased from Farmerly Pharmaceutical Corporation that were overpriced by 200 million pesos. The DBM explains they did an emergency procurement in April from local suppliers. After discovering that the prices were high locally, they negotiated directly from the foreign manufacturers which offered lower prices. If the bidders who come and bid to us are all price, pricing it at a higher price, then we have no choice but to buy it at a high price. But because we are allowed to negotiate, we open our doors not only negotiating to local suppliers, but to international suppliers as well. We will be able to get it at least at 40% to at least 50% I think 50 cheaper than the prices we are sourcing it locally. Now, here's a glimpse of what's the weather like in parts of the country. A low-pressure area, or LPA, is affecting parts of the country. State Weather Bureau Pagasa says as of 3 p.m. today, the LPA was located 215 kilometers east of Katarman, northern Samar. This LPA will cause cloudy skies with scattered rain showers and thunderstorms over Marinduque, Romblon, Quezon, Bicol Region, Visayas, and Mindanao. Meanwhile, red your umbrellas because Metro Manila and the rest of the country will experience partly cloudy to cloudy skies with isolated rain showers due to localized thunderstorms. Take extra precautions because possible flash floods or landslides may occur during severe thunderstorms. No tropical cyclone advisory is issued. Department of Justice Secretary Menardo Guevara expressed positive insights on the Pemberton case. Dante Amento tells us why. Justice Secretary Menardo Guevara considers U.S. Marine Joseph Scott Pemberton's case closed and it's time to move on. For him, the case has given important insights and lessons regarding the future of the Visiting Forces Agreement or BFA, the Administration of Criminal Justice, and the exercise of the President's constitutional powers. Pemberton was successfully deported yesterday on board a U.S. military aircraft. The implementation of the summary deportation process was smooth and fast. According to the Bureau of Immigration, the BI also disclosed that the government did not spend for Pemberton's deportation. So in this case, po, nanggaling po ito, uh, we're not privy po kung sino po yung action na gumastos, but the coordination came from the uh, U.S. Embassy po dito sa Pilipinas. So wala naman pong ginasig ang gobyerno. Aside from being deported, Pemberton is totally banned from entering the country as the consequence of the crime he committed involving moral torpitude or homicide. Uh, perpetually banned na siya from entering the country, and any attempt in the future to enter the Philippines, hindi po siya papayagang pumasok 
he will be excluded po at mababalikin siya ng gansya ng galing. Dante Amento, UNTV News and Rescue. We serve the people. We give glory to God. The Senate unanimously passes on third and final reading the Medical Scholarship Act. Senate Bill Number no. 1520, also known as the Doctor Para Sabayan Act, aims to grant medical scholarships to deserving students who have no resources to pursue medical education and to increase the number of doctors in the country. The bill also directs the cooperation between the Department of Health and the Commission on Higher Education to establish more medical schools in the country. A similar bill in the lower house was passed last August. Task Force PhilHealth submitted its report on the investigation into alleged irregularities in PhilHealth to President Rodrigo Duterte today. According to DOJ Secretary Minardo Guevara, who leads the task force, the report will attempt to present the general environment in PhilHealth, which enables fraud and corruption. Guevara adds, after the report, they have to wait for the president's further directive. But their composite team will continue its investigation and special audits. They are tasked for a case buildup and to file appropriate legal actions if necessary. Meanwhile, presidential spokesperson Secretary Hari Roque believes the president will respect the result of the task force investigation, just like the possible recommendations of filing of charges against personalities involved in fraud and corruption within PhilHealth. Binigyan niya nga po ng kapangyarihan na maging fact-finding yung uh, task force na binuo niya. No? And uh, I think dahil siya naman ang bumuo dyan, he will, ano, he will uh, accept the uh, factual findings of his own task force. The government has extended alert level 2.5 in Auckland and level 2 for the rest of the country. However, Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern has signaled an easing of restrictions next week, including, big, including bigger gatherings in Auckland and Level 1 freedoms for the rest of the country, if cases continue to decline as they have been. She made this announcement from today, today from Dunedin after the Cabinet's alert level review. Arden said that during the two weeks Auckland had been at alert level 2.5, there were 36 additional cases of COVID-19 community transmission identified. Within the Auckland cluster, she said, remains a potential trouble spot, the new subcluster from the bereavement event related to the Mount Roskill Evangelical Fellowship Church. It saw 15 more cases, she said, and while there was no evidence of significant spread outside the Auckland cluster, it raised a possibility more people have been exposed to COVID-19. Director General of Health Dr. Ashley Bloomfield recommends a short extension to the current alert levels. Auckland's alert level 2.5 will be reviewed next Monday, September 21, with a view to increase gathering limits and any changes will take effect from Wednesday, September 23 at 11.59 p.m. On why the rest of the country could not immediately move to alert level 1, Arden said modeling by the Ministry of Health suggested there is a 25% chance of COVID-19 cases spreading outside of Auckland. Let's now take a closer look at the updated count of coronavirus cases in countries worst hit by the pandemic. The United States of America remains to have the most number of confirmed cases of COVID-19 among all countries affected by the pandemic, now with over 6.5 million cases and more than 194,000 death cases, the most globally. Meanwhile, a, reco a record one-day rise in the number of new coronavirus cases around the world has been recorded. The World Health Organization says that 307,930 confirmed infections were reported over 24 hours. Chinese investments in Australia plummet, according to data. Joining us tonight is one of our correspondents in Australia, Marvi Delphine, to tell us why, live. Marvi? 
LC, new figures released today show Chinese investment in Australia almost halved in a year as distrust continues to grow and relations between the two countries deteriorate. The Australian National University research data collated since 2014 revealed Chinese investment had fallen for the third consecutive year since peaking at 15.8 billion Australian dollars in 2016. In 2019, Chinese investors laid out just 2.5 billion Australian dollars, roughly half of the 4.8 billion Australian dollars they spent in 2018. Big falls were seen in most sectors, including real estate, manufacturing, and mining, with heavy flows of Chinese investment from the mining boom tailing off. This decrease comes as Australia's federal government intensifies its scrutiny of foreign investments and announced measures to block or overturn new foreign investments deemed to compromise national security, a move widely viewed as an effort to limit growing Chinese political influence. Also, Australia's National Treasurer Josh Frydenberg introduced new restrictions designed to stop overseas companies from targeting distressed Australian assets hit by the economic impact of the COVID-19 crisis. Australian National University Professor Peter Trisdale, head of Chinese Investment Research Database, says he does not see the trend reversing anytime soon. He added to his statement, China is a major source of global foreign investment and Australia relies heavily on foreign investment to grow its economy and strengthen its market ties. There is now diminishing space for Chinese investment in Australia, as Chinese investors now view Australia as a more difficult place to invest in now. China, Australia's largest two-way trading partner, has since imposed tariffs on Australian products, from beef to barley and wine, and has discouraged Chinese students and tourists from heading down under. Diplomatic tensions have reached boiling point in the last few weeks with the recent series of disputes over foreign interference, cyber espionage, the intimidation of Australian journalists in China, trade and the Hong Kong situation. Beijing was also particularly infuriated by Canberra's role in international calls for a probe into the origins of the coronavirus pandemic, which emerged in the Chinese city of Wuhan. Elsie? Marvi, there definitely has been various international cases about cyber espionage between different countries, especially leading up to political events like the U.S. election. What is the situation there in Australia regards to China? Elsie, that's right. Just today, actually, it has been reported that a Chinese company named Genwa Data has collected and leaked the personal details of more than 35,000 Australians as part of a giant global database targeting prominent and influential figures. The said company, with connections to Beijing's military and intelligence networks, has collated profiles of 2.4 million people globally, containing a range of information including birth dates, addresses, marital statuses, political associations, relatives, and social media IDs. It collates Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, and even TikTok accounts, as well as news stories, criminal records, and corporate misdemeanors. Genoa boasts it has about 20 collection nodes scattered around the world to vacuum enormous amounts of data and send back to China. Much of the data has been drawn from public records and open source material, but some information appears to have been sourced from confidential documents like bank records, job applications, and psychological profiles, raising questions about China's intelligence gathering operations. In response to this, Australian Cabinet Minister Angus Taylor said the government had been boosting spending to the cybersecurity of this nation, ensuring that we are secure against cyber intrusion. Elsie? Thank you, Marvi, for that report. The city of Sydney continues to face pressure in cancelling its annual fireworks display 2021. Joining us tonight is another correspondent from the land down under, Early Briones, to tell us why, live. Early?
LC, the city of Sydney has constantly received challenges and criticisms from the opposition party regarding its plan for the world's famous annual fireworks display in the Sydney Harbour. The city of Sydney conceded that it may not be responsible to push for millions of crowds to gather in the year-end fireworks display for health and safety reasons. While a final decision is yet to be made, the New South Wales Police Department state that they are not confident the New South Wales Police Force would be able to manage the huge crowd if this event goes ahead. It is being argued that if some parts of regional New South Wales are forced to cancel events, then it should also apply to the city of Sydney's famous fireworks display. Let's listen to what other Sydney siders have to say about the fireworks. New South Wales currently has 3,981 confirmed COVID-19 cases, with 149 active cases and 54 fatalities. LC? Earl, how much would be the economic impact to the local economy of Sydney if the year-end fireworks display will be cancelled? LC, um, the usual return of investment to the local economy of Sydney City is about $133 million, which from the economist's point of view is too big to lose as it's even one of the most effective income generating source of the country. LC? Thank you, Early Briones, for that report. The number of fatalities in U.S. West Coast continues to increase. Meanwhile, U.S. President Donald Trump prepares to visit California. One of our correspondents in the USA, Sonny Cost, will tell us why. Death toll rises to at least 35, including a one-year-old child, according to the latest report due to ongoing wildfires in West Coast U.S. Almost a total of one million residents have fled because of the fast spread of the fire. The U.S. Weather Service's Monday forecast promised little relief for firefighters. Wind gusts will be in the 25 to 30 miles per hour range, while the smoke will impact visibility and air quality across much of West Coast U.S. Smoke has also started to affect air quality in many parts of Canada's British Columbia, with a poor air quality warning in effect until early weekdays. West Coast state governors of California, Oregon, and Washington are in unison in blaming climate change on the violent wildfires in recent years. While Los Angeles Mayor Eric Garcetti called on the White House and U.S. Congress for their lack of actionable response to the wildfires which have burned more than 4 million acres in just three weeks. More fatalities in Oregon are feared as a mass fatality incident is being prepared. Many buildings and houses have been burned and numerous residents remain unaccounted for. Meanwhile, U.S. President Donald Trump was scheduled to travel to California and meet with federal and state officials on Monday. The chief executive has somewhat blamed the Western governors for intense fire season in recent years and accused them of bad forest management. Sonicos, UN TV News and Rescue, USA. We serve the people. We give glory to God. Air New Zealand has unveiled more than 180,000 cheap fares to mark the end of the requirement for physical distancing on planes. From today, physical distancing will no longer be required on public transport and planes, but the use of masks continues to be compulsory Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern said. Chief Executive Greg Foran said today's announcement allowed the airline to make more seats available at cheaper prices. The airline is also removing change fees for domestic flights booked for travel up until Arden has announced the immediate easing of physical distancing while the country's COVID-19 alert levels remain the same until review next Monday. From today, airlines, buses, and train operators do not need to maintain any seating restrictions, but mask use will continue to be compulsory, she said. The NZ Aviation Coalition says removal of physical distancing seating requirements on planes was great news for airlines. For travelers, this will mean more available, more available seats, more flights, and affordable fares to choose from, they said. 
Japan's governing party has elected Yoshihide Suga as its new leader to succeed Shinzo Abe. This means he is close to becoming certain of landing as the country's next prime minister. Suga won the vote for the presidency of the conservative Liberal Democratic Party by a large margin, taking 377 of a total of 534 votes from lawmakers and regional representatives. 71-year-old Suga serves as chief cabinet secretary in the current administration and has been widely expected to be the victor. He is considered a close ally of Mr. Abe and likely to continue his predecessor's policies. He saw off two other contenders, Fumio Kishida, a former foreign minister, and Shigeru Ishiba, a former LDP secretary general and one-time defense minister. Suga is expected to stay in post until the elections due in September next year. In tennis, Dominic Thiem becomes the first men's player not named Federer, Nadal or Djokovic to win a slam since 2014. Team, the number two seed, roared back against Alexander Zverev to win U.S. Open, his first Grand Slam. Also, Naomi Osaka defeated Victoria Azarenka to win her second U.S. Open. Osaka rallied for three-set win, 1-6, 6-3, 6-3 for her third Grand Slam title. Former number one Azarenka was playing in her first Slam final in seven years. And those are the reasons behind the news September 14, 2020. I am Mariel Lacoza, sitting in for Angelo Castro III. Reasons we deliver to you as they unfold. I am Elsie Marcos, sitting in for William Theo. Because we need to know, we will always ask why. I am Hardin Delgado. We serve the people, we give glory to God.